Administration, I'd like to um, introduce my colleague, Kent Bostick, who's, uh, well, you, can t you can see what your position is, but he's going to give you uh, a few minutes on um, security issues associated with uh, proposal preparation. Kent. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, so good morning, and thanks, David, for giving me the opportunity to come here and just uh, provide a brief, uh, really just raise awareness uh, of ground security. Um, so my name is Ken Bosick. I'm here on, uh, on behalf of the Operations Security Working Group here at the laboratory. Um, obviously, the laboratory is committed to open exchange of information. However, certain types of information may not be freely disseminated based upon you know, uh, requirements established by the federal laws, regulations, uh, uh, agency directives or requirements you know, based on you know, company data that may be used. So all of us are, are responsible as, as employees of Argonne National Laboratory for appropriately handling the information for which these controls exist. Uh, in some cases, failure to properly handle this information can result in uh, fines, uh, criminal penalties, and administrative sanctions for individuals and organizations. So it's something that uh, you need to be kept in the, the front of your mind. Um, for your information, the Argonne Offset Program, uh, developed mechanisms, uh, to safeguard both controlled unclassified information, which I'll uh, describe in a little bit, and classified in information. And the OPSEC program, as well as other individuals within your group, your division, uh, your directorate, are available to uh, help and assist and guide you on uh, understanding uh, uh, some of the details that need to be considered. Um, my purpose really here today is, again, very brief, but just to raise your awareness to get you thinking about this as you go off and think about uh, new projects, new proposals, um, and about our collective obligation for handling information appropriately. As you consider developing proposals, whether for an existing sponsor or a new sponsor, uh, please consider the types of information that you're going to need to you know, uh, have to handle to develop a proposal, perhaps. Uh, what the project may result in, the data from that project information, and, and so that uh, from the start of that uh, whole the process that you have a handle on what kind of uh, restrictions may be applied. For example, there, you know, you may be on a project where you need access to export controlled information, or in the, in the uh, course of the project you'll be developing uh, export controlled information. Um, you know, perhaps you should consider whether or not you might be handling personal health information another example of controlled and classified information. Um, or do you have an industry partner that you're going to be working with on something and they have proprietary information and again, that's, that's sensitive unclassified information that needs to be protected. Um, the, those, these are all examples of controlled and classified information. Of course, if you get into you know, classified realm, there's uh, obviously a lot of restrictions with, with respect to that and access to that. So again, my purpose here today is simply for awareness and it's brief uh, introduction. Um, I have left in the back, there's a pamphlet you can pick up on your way out. It has uh, some information on it, very important brief information about what controlled and classified information is. But more importantly, it has uh, an email address and also some uh, links to the website where you can get more information on this. Um, and so I encourage you to pick it up and have it at your disposal. Like I said, uh, you know, send questions to that email address. There are probably people in your groups or your divisions or your director, so definitely you know, help guide you. So basically that's what I had to say today, and thanks again, David, for Okay, okay. so we'll press ahead with the uh, basics of proposal preparation. So, um, okay, so the situation here at Argonne is that we, uh, the vast majority of the funds we rely on to do our world-class research come from just one sponsor, that's the US Department of Energy, as we know. Unfortunately, the, the DOE budget is uncertain. It's always uncertain. It's good at this moment. Not, it didn't look so good a few months ago, um, and we, we're going to do well in fiscal 19, but we've got no visibility past the end of fiscal 19. Also, changing funding priorities within the department mean that uh, you know, at any point, less funds may be available to the national labs to do science or some particular type of science. So the question we therefore face is, uh, how, how can we obtain the funds we need to continue to do our work uh, at or above our current level. So, well, one answer to that question is uh, we can seek funds from sponsors outside of our traditional funding base. That's either, either inside the DOE or outside the DOE. In many cases, seeking new funds will involve writing proposals in response to solicitations. 
Um, unfortunately, as we'll see, solicitations are typically highly competitive. And the point of this presentation is to suggest some methods we can use to uh, write high quality winning proposals that will allow us what, to do what we really want to do, which is excellent, impactful research. Okay, so why should you pay attention to my thoughts on this subject? Well, you know, my, my mother kept telling me that modesty is a virtue, so I'll let you read that while I um, talk over it. So, um, I used to work for a small business. Uh, this was, I started working for Argonne about four and a half years ago. So before that, I worked for a small business. Um, we were MOCVD, Metal Organic Chemical Vapor Deposition. Um, we made transistor structures. But we, we had invented a method for making high efficiency, lightweight, flexible solar cells. So we wanted to develop this into a, a product and the board of directors of the company, who were pretty cheap, told us that, well, we could do that if we wanted, but they weren't gonna pay for it. Um, so if we wanted to do that R&D, we had to get the money for ourselves. So we, consequently, we turned to various funding agencies and over the course of five years, we raised um, somewhere between 30 million and 40 million, closer to 40, by writing about 270 proposals of which about 70 were successful. And I either wrote or helped to write all of them. So I also worked on uh, marketing and product strategy. In other words, finding customers or sponsors who would buy said flexible, lightweight, high efficiency solar cells, given the performance cost profile and uh, understanding what those customers wanted and trying to figure out what, it was, what was needed to get them to buy. Um, more generally, I'm a scientist by training, um, laser optics and spectroscopy. I have a business background. Um, I worked for Argonne for, a set for, as I said, for about four and a half years. Okay, now a lot of what I'm going to tell you here, I learned the hard way. So it's the bitter fruits of experience, or the fruits of bitter experience. Okay, so as you know, fundraising is essential for continued success as scientists, and also for the continued success of the lab. So it would be really nice if society recognized the value of what we do and provided funds accordingly, but the truth is that we are really just one of many interests, all of whom are looking for funds, either from the government or from corporations or from foundations. So, you know, in order to succeed as a PI in the face of intense competition from other scientists and non-scientific interests, you have to be able to present your ideas in convincingly in the form of a proposal. Similarly, from Argonne's point of view, funding's uncertain, it's always uncertain and many of our colleagues are seeking other sponsors. Uh, again, the key to success there is making a good, clear, written presentation of your ideas to potential sponsors. So my contention here is that writing high quality, winning proposals is a generally uh, applicable, learnable skill. And in the rest of this presentation, I'm gonna describe some of those skills with the hope that some of the information will, will make its way to, will, will be taken on board by you and will be used to, to your benefit. Okay, so feel free to, to ask questions. Uh, also, please fill out the evaluation forms which I've distributed. Um, okay, so um, we'll look at two areas of proposal preparation. One is before you start writing, and second one is when you are actually get sit down to write. Okay, so has anyone heard the first, the uh, STAR technique for presentations? No, okay. STAR, it's an acronym, stands for something they'll always remember. And the idea is basically that, you know, each presentation, there should be one thing you remember. And if you remember one thing from this presentation, that's it. Read the solicitation, okay? And it's quite important, so we'll see it three times. Um, so from some of the questions that I'm asked, it's pretty obvious that many PIs don't do this, okay? Um, I'm as guilty as anyone. Um, it's pretty difficult to read sometimes 50 plus pages, some of which are highly technical much of, most, many, most of which are irrelevant, and all of which are boring. So unfortunately, the relevant sele selections, the relevant sections of the solicitation are um, not clearly identified, so you just have to slog through it. Um, and if you do this properly, as I said, you'll be ahead of about 90% of the competition, so it's worth doing. So when you're reading the solicitation, what should you be looking for? Well, okay, so the solicitation is known by many names, for BAA, call, RFP, but in all, all cases, you, I think you should consider it as a combination of an information sheet and a questionnaire. The information sheet, so the sponsor is providing you with information about what they want and need, okay? 
uh, different wants are different from needs. We'll talk about that in a minute. Questionnaire, the, que the sponsor is telling you what they need to know, what you need to tell them for them to consider funding your work. Okay, so combination of inform information sheet and questionnaire. Um, okay, so I'll touch on a couple of, um, yeah, a couple of more important pieces of information. First one is eligibility. Before you do anything, before you write anything, understand if you're eligible to apply. If the solicitation is not open to FFRDCs, Argonne's an FFRDC, Federally Funded Research and Development Centre, or GOCOs, government-operated, government-owned, contractor-operated institutions, you're wasting your time, you're not gonna get funded, you're not eligible, okay? We have people in our organization who can help you determine eligibility. I'll provide references later on. The second thing is the evaluation criteria. This is you know, how the proposal will be evaluated, as the name suggests. It's typically a weighted list. You should consider how to, uh, you, should consider, you should plan to address all of the criteria on the list. Okay, so in larger proposals, um, for example, JCs are one of the EFRCs, you're typically asked to provide a lot of information. So to ensure that you provide all the requested information, I would strongly suggest you prepare a compliance matrix. Um, you know, it's just basically a list of the requirements presented in the proposal, formatting instructions, page restrictions, etc. I have an example at the end of the deck for your review. Okay, so um, one key to success is finding out what, clearly understanding, finding out and clearly understanding what the sponsor wants. Okay, so in the business world, these people are called customers. And you know, you'll forgive me if I lapse from time to time into business language, seeing as I spent quite a lot of time doing that. Okay, so just as a matter of interest, who here has got a customer? Uh, no one? Okay, that's surprising. Um, okay, so I'll give you a definition of a customer. A customer is someone who gives you money in exchange for your providing them with goods or services. Okay, now who thinks they've got a customer? Okay, a few more hands go up, yeah, that's good. I'd say that everyone has got a customer. Um, my customers are um, my boss, Ushma Kriplani, lab director, Paul Kearns, and your Chicago Argonne, who, pay my, who write my paycheck. Okay, so I find out what these, those folks want, need, and try to provide it to them. Okay, so I think that in general, you know, figuring out what your customer, your sponsor wants and um, uh, trying to provide them with that is, is a good thing to do, okay? So um, I think you should focus on sponsor needs rather than wants. What's the difference? A need is something you have to have. A want is something you would like to have. Okay, an example, um, I need food. I want tasty food. I can live without the salt, pepper, spices, but I need food, okay? So if you're providing something, that the sponsor needs when your competition is merely providing something that the sponsor wants, you're ahead of the game, okay? You'll, you'll succeed. So, you know, try to see the, the world in that light. Okay, another, another way of looking at things is trying to see the world, to try to understand how the sponsor sees the world. The sponsor's got customers as well, okay? The sponsor's got a boss, you know, they need to do, the sponsor needs to do things to, to, to be successful. Try and find out what problem is keeping the sponsor awake at night and try to help them solve that problem. Try to provide solutions. Okay. Margaret Thatcher, who played favorites with her cabinet, said of one of them whom she liked that, I think it was Jeffrey Howe, Jeffrey provides me with, all the, all the rest of them provide me with problems, come to me with problems. Jeffrey comes to me with solutions. Okay, so another way of looking at things. Okay, another, th the sad fact is that, you know, most people don't care about your technology you should keep looking until someone, until you find someone who does care, you know, they're, they're more likely to sponsor you. In my previous job, it, um, it took a couple of years, it took, yeah, a couple of years of working really hard to find customers who needed and were willing to pay for the properties of the solar cells that we, we made, okay? So, you know, there were certain niche markets in aerospace and military special forces who were willing to pay to get the performance our cells provided. Uh, but, uh, you know, but a lot of other people weren't, so it took time to locate these people and figure out what they wanted. Okay, so the question is, um, does sponsor discovery actually make a difference? Yes, it does. Okay, we've, we've data to show that. The um, i program, which is a uh, program where it's, it's run by universities, they take postdocs, post, uh, PhD students, postdocs, take them out of the lab for 
couple of months, give them basic entrepreneurial training, um, a key part of which is customer discovery, finding out what the customer wants, what needs and wants, uh, trying to develop a product, minimum viable product to meet customer wants, customer needs. Um, okay, so does, then they return to the lab to continue with a PhD or postdoctoral work. Does that make a difference? Yes, it does. Okay, so in, in SBIR success rates, typical SBIR success rate, small business and research program, um, the typical success rate there is something like 10 to 15% um, without i -Core training. With i -Core training, that success rate goes up to something like 50 to 60%. So you go from one in 10 chance of winning to one in two chance of winning. And the main, I think, and people running the program think that's mainly because the alumni have got much better understanding of what a customer is and how to meet their needs. So it seems to be a, a, a transferable skill. Okay, um, once you've found a suitable sponsor and you know what they need, make sure you qualify the opportunity. There's no greater waste of time than writing a proposal that will not be read because it's not responsive. It's, for example, it may be at the wrong TRL, technology readiness level. The lab's not eligible to submit. It's just barking up the wrong tree. So on and so on. There's many reasons why your, your work isn't eligible. Be sure that it is. If in doubt, ask. Okay, call a technical point of contact. You should be doing that anyway. Establish a relationship with them. Read the facts. Um, frequently ask questions. If you have a question, there's usually mechanisms for having that question answered. One thing to bear in mind, though, is that if you ask a question, it will usually be, be posted on the facts um, page for everyone to see. So don't give away too much in the question about what you're actually planning to do, because that may be one of your competitive advantages. Okay, if your idea is not funded, fundable by the current sponsor, look elsewhere or develop new ideas. In the words of one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, W.C. Fields, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, then quit. No use being a damn fool about it. I mean, that sounds cynical, but you know, if I look back in my career, the two or three big mistakes I made involved sticking at projects for too long after it became pretty obvious, or it should have been obvious, that they were just not gonna work, okay? So, you know, it sounds cynical, but you know, take up what it is. I'd also strongly recommend that you pursue um, a, a targeted approach. Submit a few high win probability proposals rather than many low win probability proposals. So writing good proposals takes a long time. Okay? Um, if, you have a, if you can increase your win probability from 10% to 30%, you know, you're gonna spend two thirds less time writing proposals. That seems like a good, a good thing to me. Okay, so, you know, pr pursue high value qualified opportunities rather than, you know, it's, it's a rifle approach versus a shotgun approach. Then you can get back to doing what you really want to do, which is science, technology development. Okay, one thing I frequently see is that many of our colleagues write proposals like they're writing journal papers. I think it's important to realize that there is a big difference between the purposes of proposals and the journal papers. Proposals are essentially sales and marketing documents. You're trying to persuade someone to, to buy effectively. Journal papers are effectively final reports. They're a description of what you've done, okay? You know, the, the proposal you're trying to make a sale, the journal paper, if you've re someone's reading it, they've you've already made the sale, okay? Therefore, the, the format and structure should be different. The key thing about the proposal is to um, get to the point early on, ideally on page one. Engage the interest of the reader, the reviewer, want, make them want to keep reading. Don't bury the lead. Lead's a term from journalism. It's getting, it basically means get to the point early on. It's journalism 101. And the reason I have that footnote is every time I put this in, if I don't have that footnote, someone tells me I've spelled it wrong. No, it's, it's, that's, spelling's correct. So the key thing is get to the point early on. Don't bury the lead. Okay, so I have an example here, the difference between an outline journal paper and an outline proposal. So I've published quite a few papers, not many recently, but a lot of my papers look like that. So, okay, this is in the context of a medical, you know, medical discovery, um, molecule with interesting properties, blah, blah, blah. So there's a therapeutic mechanism. We did some animal trials, trials more blah, clinical trials more blah. And we found a possible cure for cancer. Hmm. I decided that was pretty, pretty important and probably should be up the front. In a, and then there's concluding blah. Okay, uh, in a proposal, 
I would restructure the work. Let's restructure the, the material to look like that. I'd mention the possible cure for cancer up front. I'd then present effectively the same material in effectively the same order, but I'd add wording to show that it's um, that the uh, the work that's been done is relevant to the sponsor. So you know, it's it's not just a generic interesting properties. By the way, one of my the guy, one of the guys I post up for taught, advised me that I should never use the word interesting in um, journal papers because it might be interesting to me, but no other people might not give a damn about it. Um, so you know, rather than making a generic statement that something's interesting, tie it to the need of the of the reviewer. Non-toxic and expensive molecule that kills cancer cells. Then say why it's better than anything that's currently available. We understand the therapeutic mechanism. We want to do some animal trials. We want to do some clinical trials, and we're going to need some money. Okay, so you know, uh, no blah either. It's all to the point. You're usually going to be in a proposal. You're usually going to be constrained by page limits. There just won't be any space to for padding. Okay, so that's the difference. Um, one thing before we get to actual writing is to think about how um, reviewers will actually handle your proposal. Okay, so uh, when the, the uh, when the reviewer actually gets your proposal especially if it's a phase one type proposal, maybe 10 page proposal, your proposal will be bundled with many others, perhaps as many as 100. So this will constitute hundreds, maybe 1,000 pages of material that the reviewer is supposed to read. And perhaps only 10 to 20% of the proposals can be funded because of budget limitations. The reviewer will therefore look for, look for reasons not to read as much of this gigantic stack of paper as possible. And the way this is typically done is to execute a two-pass process, a quick first pass to screen out proposals that the reviewer certainly will not recommend for funding under any circumstances, and those will just be put to the side. And um, the second pass of the remaining maybe 20 to 30 percent will be to carefully review uh, proposals that they might fund, they might recommend for funding. <clears throat> this is also the way that VCs evaluate um, deals. It's also the way that uh, I'm told it's the way that um, uh, admissions offices uh, or um, HR offices review resumes, get rid of the ones there's no way they're going to hire, and then spend their time reviewing the ones that they might hire, look for flaws in those. Okay, consequently, how does that drive strategy? Your strategy should be not to give uh, not to give the, the reviewer a reason to reject your proposal in the first pass, get to the point in page one, comply with the formatting requirements. Um, don't fail administrative review. Administrative review is where, um, you know, I suppose the, in the solicitation they ask for, you know, 12 pages of uh, 11 point times New Roman, one inch margins, all four sides. If you provide 15 pages of 10 point aerial with half inch margins, all four sides, the reviewer probably isn't going to see that some admin will, will, will winnow that out before it gets anywhere near the reviewer. The reviewer. So comply with the formatting requirements. Um, okay, so then once you've passed the first, got, got through the first pass, give the reviewer reasons to keep, uh, keep, your, keep considering your proposal on the second pass. Provide good ideas, can't help you with that, but it can certainly help you with presenting those good ideas. Stand out from the competition in a good way. Um, you know, you stand out, this is the most stupid idea I've ever heard in my life. You stand out, not in a good way. Provide points of differentiation, okay? So if you're competing against, if you know who you're competing against, and in many fields you do, there's maybe only half a dozen other labs or PIs in the country that could actually respond to um, the solicitation. Uh, you know, if you know who they are, say why you're different, better than they are, why you're more, more meritorious than, than, your, than your, your competition is. You don't need to call out the competition by name. The reviewer will probably know who they are as well, but see why you're different, what makes, what makes you be different, better, more qualified in the competition. Also, um, read the review criteria. That's how the reviewers are supposed to evaluate the proposal. They've probably read it. We've probably read the review criteria. You should too. <coughs> Okay, now get to the, oh, sorry, there's a question. Yes? No, I was wondering, will you repeat your slides 
Okay, so yeah, thanks. I should have said this earlier on. Yes, this, the slides will be distributed. I will send them out to everyone who registered for this session. I'll also put them online, so there's no need to take extensive notes or take pictures of the screen. Thanks for the reminder. Okay, now, when we actually sit down and write the proposal, um, what should the proposal look like? Well, my strong recommendation is that on the first page you recite the Heilmeier Catechism. Anyone heard of that? Someone has, a couple of people have, good, good. Um, okay, so the Heilmeier Catechism. Um, okay, so it's, it's all about risk evaluation. Heilmeier was a uh, DARPA director, um, as it says there. DARPA is in, this DARPA is a Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the people who brought you the internet. Um, they are in the risk business. They fund um, high risk, high reward, high potential reward uh, projects. Uh, understanding that, Heilmeier developed this catechism to help agency officials think through and evaluate proposed research programs. They're risk accepting, but they want to obviously limit the risk that they do accept. Okay, so key point, well, you can read that yourself, um, but the key points there, um, you know, the first four I think are the most important. What are you trying to do? Explain it clearly, jargon free. How is it done today? Um, what are the limits? What's new in your approach? Why do you think it'll be successful? And who cares? You know, if you're going to be successful, what difference is it going to make? Okay. Um, another story. Uh, one of the good reasons for dealing with DARPA is that their funding agents have quite a lot of discretion to give out reasonable sized chunks of money with minimal oversight. So we, we shopped our, uh, sorry, presented our solar cell idea to DARPA, which was something they were interested in. So during the discussion, the person I was speaking to said, yeah, well, we can give you 250K to do some work in this stuff, uh, but you, we can't just give you a check. We're going to have to, have to write a proposal. Okay, so I said, well, what's, what's, what needs to be in the proposal? And he recited that. He, he listed that. He, he presented that list from, by mem from memory. He never referred to Heilmeier. I only found out about the Heilmeier catechism about um, a couple of years ago. My contact never referred to it by that name, but those points, he listed all the points. So it clearly is something that is just in the, the DARPA mindset. It's just the way they do business there. So, you know, if you're ever approaching DARPA, you probably should make your approach in that, with that type of format, you know, tell, giving, them, giving them that type of information. The same applies to other agencies, other funding institutions. If they usually ex expect a proposal to be presented in a certain format or they're looking for certain pieces of information, you should find that out ahead of time and try and give it to them. Make it easy for them. Okay? The other thing that I recommend doing on page one of your proposal is adding a picture. Um, I think it pictures that illustrate the idea, whether it's a new process, a new molecule, a new, uh, you know, a new experiment, is the reviewer and understanding the process, understanding what you're proposing. And that's a picture of Heilmeier with some optoelectronic device, which was only with state-of-the-art in 1976, but is now made by the billion. It's an every consumer product. Um, okay, so other things you can do um, to emphasize, make the reviewer aware of what you want them to know about is um, use typography, underlining bold fonts, bold fonts, boxes to bring out, highlight the key points that you want them to, to read. Okay, so just to summarize, the objective of the first page of your proposal is that after reading the first page of your proposal, ideally the first paragraph, the reviewer should have a clear idea of what you plan to do, why it's different, um, how you plan to do it, and why it's responsive to the solicitation. And after reading the first paragraph or two, the reviewer should be strongly motivated to read the rest of your proposal and not throw it away like the other 70% that they're going to throw away. Okay, so, um, by the way, many of these, uh, as I said, a lot of this is the fruits, bitter fruits of experience. And, you know, um, I've run up against many of these, both when I was writing proposals, when I was reading proposals. So these are... You know, the, the, in the body of a proposal, there's a, here's a, here are, this is a list of a few things to watch out for. I could go on at length about any of these, and there are other topics I could cover, but I just don't have time. These are some of the more important ones. Um, I think the most important thing is to make it easy for the reviewer. Okay, they're doing a difficult job, a boring job. They probably don't want to be doing it, so make it easy for them. Make it easy for them to find the information they're going to need to assess your proposal. I'd suggest that, you know, as I said, the, the solicitation... 
and request certain pieces of information. I would suggest you provide the requested information in the requested order um, and use headings and labels as a guide. So if they ask for, you know, a literature survey and um, discussion of previous work, provide a, a section labeled literature survey, discussion of previous work, and so on. Make it easy for the, I mean, don't make it easy for the reviewer to find the, the relevant sections. Don't assume that they're going to read the proposal from cover to cover. They're probably not. They're probably going to look for certain sections that's of most interest. Make it easy for them to find those sections. Another key thing is not to overpromise. The result of a successful proposal is not, unfortunately, a check in the mail. It's an invitation to negotiate a contract. Um, ensure that you don't have to drastically reduce the scope of work once you think more carefully about what you can do with the available money and time. Um, if you overpromise, it can also be known as bait and switch, and it can be a reason to withdraw the invitation to negotiate. Um, so. What you propose, you should actually be willing to do what you say you're going to do in the proposal, willing and able to do what you, what you say in the proposal you're going to do and not have to back off a lot when you actually think about it more carefully. Um, milestones, you should have milestones, they should be realistic. Again, can you actually do them? Again, they're going to be subject to negotiation. You probably want to, in your proposal, put a less aggressive set of milestones than you're actually willing to, to able to do because the, the reviewer is probably going to want, or the program manager is probably going to want a more aggressive set of milestones. So give yourself some slack for negotiation, give some room for negotiations. Um, one question that frequently occurs is anticipated obstacles. The answer to that question is never none. It means either your work, if you say, you know, what, if you answer none, it means either that your work is not aggressive enough, therefore why should you fund it, or you haven't thought in detail about what can go wrong. Okay, and if you once you've provided some possible obstacles or problems, always provide solutions so that you've thought that you know if, if a key, a key part of your uh, proposal is to grow some material with certain properties at a certain cost, and you think the obstacles are you know some chemical issue. Well, there should be a couple of ways that you can a couple of backup approaches that you can you can use if your first primary approach doesn't work. Figures, okay, figures are good. Um, I recommend using them to break up large blocks of text. Oh, that's the second reason. The main reason is for illustration and um, enlightenment, um, but also to break up large monolithic blocks of text, which are very, very boring. One key thing to note is that figures that look good a quarter of a page are typically illegible when they're reduced to two inches on a side. So, you know, um, <coughs> design your figures with that in mind. Also, I'll point out that there are graphics specialists at Argonne who can help you prepare figures will be legible and comprehensible at the final scale. Okay, so once you get past the, the technical section of the proposal, it's good not to slack off when you get, when you get to the end, the, the back end of the boilerplate. People do actually read the back end. The thing is that they're probably not the same people who read, who read the front end, write accordingly. It's a mistake to assume that anyone's going to read your proposal from cover to cover, as I said. Um, sometimes that shows up in the solicitation. You're asked for effectively the same information in the, technical, in the technical section of the proposal as you are in the back end. So facilities is a good example. You might be asked for your facilities in the technical section and again in the, the back end. Provide information in both places because maybe different people are going to read it. Um, okay, budget is also important. Get your divisional finance professional involved as soon as possible. Um, again, as with the scope of work, the budget in the final proposal should be as close as possible to the budget you actually end up with after contract negotiations. During the contract negotiations, you're typically going to be asked to provide um, justified um, pay rates and cost estimates. Um, so it's again, it's embarrassing, if not fatal, if you um, have to, uh, if, if you find out that pay rates are actually 20% higher and therefore you can provide 20% less work than you said you could. Avoid that mistake. Um, a budget that's materially different from the one you proposed has grounds for terminate negotiations. Um, Commercialisation. Uh, I'm sorry, one, one other point. One point to note is that if you're uh, calculating matching funds, be careful about the difference between the percentage of total cost and total, total budget and the percentage of government contribution. I got this wrong once in a fairly big proposal and I left $50,000 on the table. So this was when I was in industry, I get yelled at for leaving $50,000 on the table, but 
not as loudly as I would have got yelled at if my boss had not made exactly the same mistake when confronted with exactly the same information. So, you know, be careful about percentage of match as a percentage of total budget versus match as a percentage of government contribution. Um, commercialization, that's taken increasingly seriously these days. Um, you need, it's important to write a realistic commercialization plan if you're asked for one. Um, TCP can help you with that. There's no one way to write a realistic plan, but there are many ways to write plans that are guaranteed to fail just because you clearly don't know what you're talking about when you talk about commercialization. An example of that is suppose you're, you're making something which, you wanna, which is of use in the automotive industry and you say that your route to market, your commercialization plan is to, start, is to um, start a startup and then sell to the big three automotive companies. Anyone that knows anything about the automotive industry, that's not gonna work because the, the big three don't buy from startups. They buy from tier one vendors, they buy from tier two vendors, they buy from tier three vendors who might buy from startups. So, you know, your, your, your commercialization plan can be fatally flawed for reasons that you, you may not even be aware of. Um, okay, throughout, and even in the boilerplate, uh, seek a professional appearance. Things, you know, you see proposals with, where there's resumes of 10 different, 10 different people, all in different formats. I personally find that very difficult to read, and it's jarring, and it doesn't look very good. So, you know, use consistent formatting. I think that, that improves the, the quality of the final document. Okay, so con some concluding thoughts on writing the proposal. The key thing I said, I said is uh, make it easy for the reviewers. Okay, uh, something to always remember. This is the other thing I think you should always remember. If you remember two things, this is the other one. Make it easy for the, for the reviewer. Um, okay, general thoughts. Use simple sentences. Think um, Ernest Hemingway rather than Henry James. Um, use the active voice. It makes your writing better. Um, you know, active voice versus passive voice. We did it right, we used the active voice versus mistakes were made, the passive voice was used. It just makes your writing more powerful. Spelling and grammar, I mean, I'm, I'm someone who just can't read, if, if, I, if I'm reading a document that's laden with spelling mistakes and grammatical mistakes, I just can't see past that to, the, to the, the technical content of the document. I believe some reviewers are like that as well. The um, proposal should be visually appealing. Um, there's nothing more likely to put someone to sleep than, you know, a solid wall of text unrelieved by figures or a single page which is all one paragraph. So, you know, use paragraphs of reasonable length and insert spaces between them. I don't, I don't favor figures just as decoration, but if you've got 10 pages with nothing but text, put in a couple of figures just to break it up. It makes it so much easier to read. Um, planning, okay, so planning as we all know is very important and it's important for long proposals, you know, sometimes you're going to be writing a 50 page proposal, you can't just sit down and write a 50 page proposal. It involves multiple authors and expect it to turn out well when you're done. You've got to plan. Okay, so, you know, in addition to the compliance matrix, write an outline, allocate work, work accordingly, manage it like you run, you manage any other serious project. Write an outline, allocate work, have review meetings, prepare a template, prepare a timeline, ask for deliverables by a certain time and expect your co-authors to to produce on time. Okay. You're much less likely to have a scramble at the end. Reviewing, yeah, okay. So always have someone review a proposal before you submit it. Okay, anyone ever had the experience where they write something that's perfectly clear and you come back a couple of days later and it doesn't make any sense at all or you write something and you, know, you show it to your boss and it's like, what the hell is this about? Anyone had that? Okay, yeah, I have. Um, so internal reviews catch that type of thing, okay. Um, so the re level of review um, depends on the complexity of the proposal and the scope of the project. Okay, so for smaller projects, a few pages, having one of your colleagues or your boss review it, that might be fine. For longer proposals, JC's review, for example, was 500 pages. Um, recommend color team reviews. Um, so that's where, you know, um, you prepare a, an outline um, then write a draft around that outline, uh, then you know, review it, have a pink team review it to see if the, the draft actually is comprehensible um, you know, with graphs, tables and so on. Uh, then you know, feedback from the pink team, write a final, write a red team draft which is 90% complete thereabouts. Um, then have that reviewed again by people outside the project team are going to review it from the sponsor's point of view. Um, 
feedback from that goes to the gold team draft, which is the final draft to be submitted, which is reviewed for grammar and you know clarity and format layout and all that type of thing. Okay, so that's that type of process is appropriate to large, longer proposals. Again, TCP can help you with this. We do that. We did this for JCs. We did it for the FRC proposals. We do it for other larger proposals. One another thing, just as a note of courtesy, if someone takes the time to review, provide a detailed review of your um, proposal, please, um, you know, pay attention to the suggestions and implement them as necessary. I've had, I've spent a couple of occasions. I've spent hours reading, reading a proposal, writing a review to have the author ignore everything I said. It's, you don't think I'm ever going to review for them. Well, you know, just be courteous. Okay, proposal submission. Um, the message here is don't leave it to the last minute. Okay, proposal submission is inherently a deadline-driven exercise, so I realize this is counterintuitive. So this is, you know, these are two things that are just not consistent or compatible. And most proposals are right, submitted within, within hours or minutes of the deadline. But some, for some things, especially if you're inexperienced, just, you're doing this for the first time, there are some things that you just cannot leave to the last minute. Okay, so for example, some sites require registration, which might take a couple of days to complete. You've got to do that ahead of time. Some, form, some online sites, for example, grants.gov, have got long, complicated application forms, the SF-424, for example. Um, you will not be able to fill that out in half an hour. It will take hours to fill that out. Again, figure that, figure that out ahead of time and plan accordingly. Um, also, response times typically increase drastically close to deadlines, response time on websites. Um, so, you know, don't try submitting five minutes before the, the deadline. I mean, having said all that, um, and with making a deliberate attempts to do otherwise, I think every proposal I've ever submitted has been submitted within 24 hours of the deadline. And many were submitted within minutes of the deadline, but it would be nice to try, to try, to try and do things differently. Um, okay, so we have, uh, okay, once you've submitted a proposal, please let the SPP office know. Contact there is Diane Hart. Um, we just like to know what's in the pipeline so that we can plan accordingly. Okay. Follow up. Okay, so you've submitted your proposal and you're, you're, act you're anxiously awaiting the news. The sad fact is that most of the time the news will be bad. Okay. Um, we are in an intensely competitive and risky business. So the key thing is to understand why you failed and to use this as an opportunity for improvement. Okay. Um, ask for a written debrief. Always ask for a written debrief. Sometimes you'll get one automatically. Sometimes you have to ask. Sometimes you won't get one no matter what you do, but get something in writing as to why the reviewers rejected your proposal. Talk to the technical point of contact. Okay. You should be doing that anyway. Um, it, help, <clears throat> it helps to build a relationship. It also shows um, interest and commitment. Some points of contact, I'm told, will not fund anyone on the first time of asking. They, they want two or three proposals just to show that the, the applicant is serious. They're in the game. They're in the game for the long run. They've got the interest and the commitment and the resources to continue with the, with the work. Talking to the technical point of contact and building a relationship or suggesting ideas for future funding, that helps a lot. Okay. Sometimes, on the other hand, you're going to succeed. The, there, the thing is that the, the, the routine is similar. Well, once you've done turning car wheels down the corridor, you know, it's, just, it's the same type of routine. Understand why you're successful. A lot of, uh, understand why you're successful and use your success as an opportunity for, for improvement. If you know what you did right, do it right. The next, do the same thing the next time. Okay, if you know what particular sponsors like, do that again. And as I said, many of the bitter fruits of experience came from debriefs, both good, well, from bad debriefs, and uh, you know things we did right you know, from from good debriefs. So you know I would use it as a learning experience. Okay, so that's the main part of the proposal. I know the next couple of slides are support that Argon provides PIs like yourselves on writing proposals. Um, okay, so TCP, um, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm in TCP. We um, assist with the preparation and submissions of proposals. Um, we can help you, well, I'm not going to read this to you, but you know, we can help you do the things that are described there. Um, prepare and submit proposals, um, develop capture plans for new competitively awarded funding opportunities, and work with external contractors to prepare proposals as we did with JCs or EFRCs. Okay. 
Um, that's my contact information there, and um, you can search for me on Inside Argon. Um, other resources we provide, well, as I mentioned, um, Argon provides graphic support. Okay, by the way, um, this, my, my assistance is at no additional cost to you. You don't have to provide with a cost code. I mean, it's, you know, once my time's allocated, you don't provide, you don't need to provide with a cost code. Other sources of assistance, um, as I mentioned, we have graphic support, um, creative services, they'll provide graphics and other visual materials. Um, they, are, they are not, you'll have to provide them with a cost code, but they're not as expensive as you would think, and they do a really good job on a fairly compact timescale. Um, other service we provide is technical writing and editors. The lab has a team of technical writers and editing editors. They can develop content. They can also read, write, read, rewrite, and proofread text. There's the contact there, and there's some unsolicited, unsolicited testimonial. Again, you have to provide them with a cost code, but they're not too expensive. The guidance and eligibility. I mentioned this a few times that you're complete, if you if you apply for something that, for which you're not eligible, you are completely wasting your time. Um, the SPP office, Diane Hart, she, is, she, she can provide guidance on, that, that office, Diane, can, can provide guidance on um, eligibility. She's done this type of thing uh, a, a lot. So, you know, talk to her. If you're in any doubt, talk to her. Okay, so a couple of reference, pages of reference material. This is a compliance matrix. I know you can't read it, but it's legible on the, the PDFs of the, the slideshow. What I do is just take the proposal, go through it in detail, list every requirement, then, um, you know, there's valuation criteria listed, mention those, make sure you address them. You're going to have multiple authors, assign sections to authors, provide deadlines, page limits, and, you know, um, notes and comments. Use this as a tool to manage the writing of the proposal. Finally, some other resources. These are things which are, um, that I found to be very useful. Um, elements of style for how to write clearly, pyramid principle for how to um, structure presentations. So effectively the pyramid um, leads are what's used in newspapers. You tell the important thing first, as I said, but then you broaden the structure out so you can provide successive levels of detail. Effectively what you can do is then you can cut, the editor can cut the story from the end without losing the critical information. You're just losing detail. That's, but this is from a business and technical perspective, rather than a newspaper's perspective. Dale Carnegie, it sounds trite and corny, but you know, some things are just never get old, like never ever tell anyone they're wrong. That's from, that's from How to Win Friends. And then the Chicago Mind Love Style for your um, grammar gurus, detailed information on how to format documents, how to cite references, how to you know, lay out documents properly. That's the, the, that's the, the, the manual, that, that's the style manual that Argon uses for its documents. Okay, so that concludes my presentation. So thank you for your attention. Anyone have any questions? We have a few minutes remaining. Questions? Yes? Okay, yeah, so the, the question was, uh, I'm assuming it's addressed to, to the, uh, the, su the support we provide. The question was, um, does, the match, does the size of the proposal matter? Uh, yeah, yes, it does. Um, we, are, we have a, a limited, we have a finite set of resources, uh, a finite amount of money to provide these, these services. Um, in practice, the, the higher value proposals are going to get the attention, okay? What we're trying to do is put, provide, put together a, a tiered response format where, you know, um, really high value proposals like JCs or, or EFRCs get the, they, they work with external contractors. Lower value proposals, we would work ex in, intensively with um, the, uh, the PI. This would, you know, well, I'm not going to give financial numbers, but lower value proposals, middle value proposals, we would work, we would work intensively with the PI to provide the type of service I described, but that, all that would be sort, would be resourced internally. Then for lower value proposals, well, we can provide, you know, a couple of hours here and there of, you know, working with the PI to, you know, craft a nice proposal given what's in the, what's in the solicitation. Okay, so, yeah, it, 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 so that, that's, that's kind of overview of what we can do. Anyone else? 
Sorry, was I really that clear? Okay. Okay, well, if there's no one else, no other questions, um, my contact information is there, so please feel free to call me or email me. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll be happy to, to talk to you about, about writing proposals. So thanks again for, for coming. And uh, please fill out the, uh, uh, the review sheet and put it in the box beside the door. Thanks. <laughs>